welcome back. Hello. This is Bad Marriages in the Bible, and we are your hosts. I'm Sean. I'm Kate. And we are uh, the Norrises. We are the founders of Dandelion Ministries, where we create space for you to experience and know the grace of Jesus Christ in your place of need. And uh, we do that through podcasts, through retreats, um, through blogs, through our art primarily. Mm -hmm. Um, Kate's a painter. I'm a musician. And um, we're also pastors and ministers in the Anglican Church. So that's who we are. And this podcast is is to create that space. We want you to have something uh, in your day where you can actually, whether it's driving or taking a run or just sitting uh, somewhere, just listen to uh, the Word of God and hear how He brings redemption into our places that are hurting, into our entire lives. Mm -hmm. And uh, we figured we would look at the marriages in the Scriptures because uh, we're always interested in talking about marriage. And they are one of the places where we see our sin the most Mm. (laughs) in Mm. our deep relationships and um, where our love, where we want love and we need love. And yet somehow it, uh, there's always uh, areas where we are desperate for grace, right? Mm. It exposes the fact that we don't love the way that we should or uh, need to be loved. Yes. Yes. And the Bible makes sure to include all of these, um, all of the wrong turns and, and, in sort of the we're in the Old Testament right now, mm-hmm. and some of the big heroes of the faith, um, the ones that carried God's promise throughout the generations in um, ancient uh, Israel and before Jesus was born, the ones that carried the promise um, wrote their own stories down about their problems in their marriages. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So we just wanted to, you know, help someone who might be trying to read the Bible. Um, There are some tough passages in there and some weird stories. And you're like, well, what, what's that about? (laughs) So we wanted to look at it with you and pull out um, what God might be doing um, with these bad marriages to show his big redemption. That's right. Yeah. It's something you don't need to be afraid of the fact that you uh, have problems. That's right. (laughs) Welcome to the club. And that uh, you, even with the people you love the most in this world, that you find yourself losing patience or getting frustrated or being hurt by them. Mm. Um, That's just because we are broken. That's what scripture describes. And in fact, one version of Christian maturity um, that folks who are super into the grace of God, like C.S. Lewis might um, describe as as a Christian grows in maturity. They grow in awareness of their sin and of their need for Jesus's forgiveness and of the assurance that they have it. And so the more mature a Christian is, the more, the less they take themselves seriously, the more they, you know, are quick to own their mistakes and to show, look at that. I, you know, there's my sin again. Um, and I have a redeemer and I have a savior. And so they, you know, are there, they grow in their, their understanding of how much God loves them and how much grace he's given to them and how much assurance that they have, but they also grow in their awareness of their sin. (laughs) That's right. Yes, that's good. He, Jesus is the point of Christianity, mm. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, he has made us uh, his object of love, which yes. is incredible. Yes. So, um, yeah, a mature Christian, for lack of a better phrase, is one that just continually points to him and highlights what he has done and how good he is, as Kate said. So, so mm. you have something you want to say just now. Well, I was going to say, it's not to say he doesn't bring healing and redemption as we're talking about the whole time but again you never stand on that as like oh i've arrived never to fall again you know you're always in need of that grace and there can be real healing real forgiveness real new life but that only makes you grow in the dependence on his grace yeah that's the interesting thing is so often um as humans, I think our default setting of what we think being whole is and being mm. healed is, is actually, I think, uh, directly related and correlates to our sin and <laughs> the fact mm. that we think 
being whole and healthy and all that stuff means that we are uh, autonomous, that we are individuals that don't need any more, and uh, that we mm-hmm. are somehow completely whole ourselves and it was a God unto ourselves with, mm-hmm. for lack. I mean, we don't necessarily all think that going around thinking we're trying to be gods, but that was the whole point. And uh, the garden that the serpent was tempting Adam and Eve with is to not need God. Mm. And so we often think uh, just reflexively that growth and um, health means that we become less needy. Mm. And that is not the case. That's not actually, and that's why I think talking about marriage when we get into relationships, we start to see like, that's actually not at all how we're made to be. Mm. We're actually built to be interdependent. Mm. We're actually built to be uh, people that need others. It's something that they say in the uh, recovery rooms um, all the time. They say we need people mm. because when we're on our own, when we're isolated, which is the kind of the ideal that the serpent held up to Adam and Eve, uh, only bad things happen. Mm. <laughs> and, and we actually start to die. Something about us starts to die and we don't mm. have others. And so this wholeness and health and, you know, all of that is actually a picture of being in right relationship with God and with others. Mm. So we're actually in, we become aware of our needs and we find our needs being met in the right place and in the right right way. And you grow in compassion. You know, we have so benefited from 12 step groups with codependence anonymous or Al-Anon and um, we, they have a a phrase there, but the grace of God go I, you Mm -hmm. know? And so when you have experienced healing and you can look back at your sin and say, there is how God redeemed it and used it for good and forgave me and helped me walk in forgiveness and amends and actually created a change where I needed it. That is, was more life giving than what I was doing before. And, um, so there, you know, you've experienced some healing. It makes you grow in compassion for others who, who are stuck, you know, in a pattern that you recognize or that you see. Um, it makes you grow in compassion versus self-righteousness. That's right. Right. That's right. Boom. Mm -hmm. There we are. (laughs) So, uh, we are, we are hanging out with Solomon. Uh, we got to first Kings. We got actually got up to the beginning of second Kings. Um, and we decided this would be a good time since we got to Solomon and it's, we're right at the point in Second Kings where we find out that he has a thousand women in his life, and it's mm. not hyperbole. Seven hundred wives, three hundred concubines. Mm. Um, so there's that, and we've decided this would be a good time to actually look at one of the books attributed to him. He is credited with uh, much of the wisdom literature in Scripture mm. because, as we've read a few weeks back, he prayed to receive wisdom as the ruler of God's people. And God loved that and gave him wisdom. And uh, so those books are um, uh, the book of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and even though Ecclesiastes is not probably by him, but still, and then Song of Solomon. (laughs) So here we are. But those are, it's a three, there's three books that are considered the books of wisdom in scripture. And those are, those are they. They're, they're credited to him, although Perhaps some other authors either contributed to them or even wrote them, but it was sort of during that time right. under his purview, perhaps in his school. Yeah, they think possibly wisdom. his students. Yeah. The guys, yeah. Anyway, I only say that be- because I had to write a really long paper on Ecclesiastes in <laughs> seminary. So <laughs> my professor, if she was listening to this, would be like, oh, Sean, uh, he better not say it was by Solomon. Anyway, <laughs> here we are. Song of Solomon, though, is attributed to him. And we talked about the authorship issues uh, a couple episodes ago. But the interesting thing about it is that we hear this guy who is considered one of the wisest ever to live by God's grace. And then he goes on and has this ridiculous polygamous life. Mm. I mean, it's ridiculous. That's the level of ridiculous. (laughs) Is the level of ridiculous. Except in his, um, you know, in his worldview, he's like, I'm wealthy. Might as well take care of all these women. Take care of a thousand women. And all the women were probably like, sweet, you know, (laughs) I don't have to be poor. This is great. That's right. They have their calendar. They only have to see him like once a year. Yeah. (laughs) It was like, like, (laughs) they get to enjoy hanging out in the palace. (laughs) And so you see kind of the cultural you know, the cultural way. And so no, nobody saw anything really wrong with it in the cultural way. 
But the scripture says those wives pulled his heart away from the Lord. You know, he loved them more than he loved the Lord. And he was followed their religions and right. got sucked into their their different religions. So, yeah. Um, Which, you know, we still do that. <laughs> I mean, like people do that all the time. We yeah. get pulled into each other's stuff. And it's, you know, the bad cliches that are out there like happy wife, happy life, you know, all that kind of stuff is basically like, I'm just going to enable whatever you want Mm. so that I don't have to be frustrated or whatever. That's right. That was Solomon's t-shirt. That's what he wore all the time. And it was bad for him. It was bad for him. (laughs) Women have also done that. And it's bad for women. Watch the, watch the current Barbie movie that's trying to break women out of that mentality where you just do everything to please your husband and it doesn't help the women. Or the husbands, ultimately. There you go. Before Barbie, there was Solomon. (laughs) (laughs) So so ridiculous because he was a guy with 700 wives. And it's ridiculous because Barbie is like oppressed women all over the world. It's It's actually a perfect analogy. It's an amazing thing you just brought in. So anyway. But the movie is trying to be (laughs) pro-women. That's what we're saying. We're saying Solomon was one suffering under and trying to please others. Anyway. I am cannot <laughs> is also like the <laughs> That's right. That's right. Barbie Which, do you know that was that was nominated for an Oscar anyway that song. I don't oh really? It yeah, it was. How about that? Kenneth. Yeah, Barbie is to the feminist movement <laughs> as Solomon is to um a vi- vivacious um sexual life in in monogamous marriage. <laughs> that's right. Well, that's where we're going with all this. Enough of the intro, but that's what we're trying to get to the book. And so that's the thing. This book is Song of Solomon. It is the book about sex. Yep. In scripture, and it is Yeah, if you weren't prepared for this podcast to be about sex, <laughs> we should have perhaps <laughs> well, given you a is. little <laughs> It's going to be. This is um this particular one in this series, we'll be talking about that. Yeah, just while we're in this book, um, we would be remiss had we not. I mean, if we do a whole thing on marriage and we don't talk about this book, we would be bad at what we're doing. So yes. we have to. <laughs> we are. And, you know, fun fact, Sean and I met in high school on a missions trip. And during that missions trip where we are serving the poor and building houses in Juarez, Mexico, feel like making love by <laughs> who's it by bad company by in bad fact you have company. to ask that it's a vital part of our relationship <laughs> it is so vital we will be married what like 22 years this year and, and i still remember? can't retain that <laughs> name of that band by bad company um so that came on the radio and sean was like oh this is a great song we had like met you know a day before and he was like singing it to me and i was like wow <laughs> what is it was on the radio and i was like we got to listen to this it is a fantastic <laughs> song it's a fantastic <laughs> and you're like now knowing you you're like into the classic rock and into the way it grooves and you loved all of that and i was like okay wow this is <laughs> that's right yeah that's I, how we started that was subconscious by the way i actually did not think that i was sending that message to her <laughs> in that moment so i was like genuinely like you need to listen to this great song <sighs> but it turned out i was right Either way, so well done me (laughs) as a 17-year-old. That's right. Song of Songs would amen that song. That's right. (sighs) So we're going to look at the first section. So Song of Songs is basically broken down into five, I think, five or six. About five poems. Yeah. Yeah. And we're going to look at the first one that takes us uh, through chapter one to chapter two, verse seven. And we're going to see that this book is laid out. It's, It's poetry. As we said, so it's it's wisdom literature. There's a couple things here. There's wisdom literature, which is a, a genre, but then it's also poetry, which is an you know an additional genre. And so it moves and flows in that way, where there's a call, almost call and response throughout the whole thing. Um, you hear the a couple different characters speaking, and uh, it's very beautiful, and it is using very uh, it's using all sorts of imagery. Um, Mm -hmm. symbolic imagery lots of natural things like fruits and vegetables and fragrances gardens yeah Mm -hmm. pillars things like this animals yeah so it's employing all of this imagery to talk about uh, sensual love their bodies about their bodies Mm -hmm. it's about the emotional side of sex and then also the physical it gets it goes all Mm -hmm. right in there Mm -hmm. and um and it is this resounding affirmation Mm. which i think we said a couple uh episodes ago but it's a resounding affirmation of god once again 
uh, of of his physical creation, of yes. the fact that he made us and he made things and he actually spoke things into being. And it's not just this kind of detached, ethereal, uh, theoretical thing. Mm. Life. Mm -hmm. Life is actually grounded in flesh and bone mm. and uh, in this world. And so he is saying like, yes, this is great. This is what I made. I made this to work this way. And like, I want you to enjoy it and all the pleasure and the, um, the desire that comes with it is part of me making that, you know, it's part of his design. That's right. That's right. And we spoke about the two sort of spectrums too of a very kind of prudish Christian anti-sexual um, yeah. view Kind of puritanical stuff. Puritanical where, you know, you only have sex to procreate and it's yeah. viewed as sinful and, you know, priests aren't even supposed to get married and not even supposed to engage in such a sensual, you know, lustful thing. And so there was sort of a looking at it as sin and then in the culture looking at it um, as a casual, you know, sex is for everybody all the time, anytime. And, and we are... You know, everything can be sexualized mm. and you can engage in it willy nilly <laughs> with no consequences. Yeah. Um, and so that would be the other end of the spectrum. You can and you should, frankly. Like that's the. Yeah. That's, that's how you test out your partner. Yeah, Are the they good in the bedroom? Of, yeah. Yeah. It's kind of the gospel of the culture of sex. You know, it's like you should be able to do this this is how you right this is how you evaluate your compatibility yes. <laughs> like are you good at sex so it starts with it usually yeah and which it, i mean on one level it makes sense because there are just on a very natural level like when you just see somebody who's good looking you're like ooh, right you, know, you feel desire for that person that kind of thing and that's how it begins yes but um the culture then says like so lead with that and scripture instead and our faith would say, no, 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 this is the culmination. You're building to that. Yes. Like that is the, that's the destination of real intimacy, right? Yes. Yes. That's a good way of putting it. Yes. And so we'll see in this first, um, this first sort of poetic cycle um, that the bride or the, she's called, um, just she, uh -huh. but um, she's called daughter. She's called my beautiful one. The two terms, um, his, the groom's favorite term for her is my beautiful one. And her favorite term for him is my beloved. Mm -hmm. And so you'll see that they both, you know, use other things too. She, uh, he uses my beloved also, but he especially loves to call her my beautiful one. And she especially loves to call him my beloved. And, she, you'll see um, that she kind of sees him at first and wants his kisses, and then that builds. And you'll see the the her sexual desire for him, you know, builds, and she's letting it run away with her. And that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. She's letting it run away with her, and by the end, she's like feeding herself with more, you know, raisins and apples and. Uh, things that are associated with as aphrodisiacs, as um, food that are sweet and that promote um, lovemaking. Uh, and so she wants that to culminate with him in his banqueting house. Yeah, in his chambers. <laughs> in his yeah. chambers. And he right. wants his close embrace. And and so that is a good progression to let the... Um, to let the romance and to let those sexual desires run away with you. And then it ends right here and also in the other two cycles at the end of Song of Songs in eight and then also in Song of Songs three. Um, you'll see it ending with her telling her friends, O daughters of Jerusalem, I adjure you by the gazelles or does of the field that you not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. Mm -hmm. And so just what Sean was saying there about it having its proper place, it's a culmination um, that scripture is showing us that the, the place where this is safe um, is in marriage. And even Song of Songs has that own, we talked about that, the structure, even though it's got these cycles of poetry, each one having kind of a moment of consummation at the end of it, the whole thing is structured with 
chapter four at the center Mm -hmm. with the bride being named as a bride and the groom being, you know, being the king and their, so it's, it's in the context of marriage Mm -hmm. that that's meant to be. And the other scriptures surrounding it, you know, we see that in Genesis chapter two, 24, God's called developing marriage. He created marriage and said the two shall be a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his, to the woman and the two shall become one flesh. Mm. Um, and then another, another King Solomon <laughs> quote, um, from Proverbs in Proverbs five, um, verses 15 to 19, he says, be intoxicated with the wife of your youth. Mm. So the song of Solomon's is more oriented for the bride adoring her, her husband. Um, it's more focused that way. He adores her back, but it's more of her. It starts from her voice. Yeah. Her voice. Then Proverbs gives the male, you know, perspective, be intoxicated with her love and with her body and enjoy the wife of your youth. And then you see that again, echoed by the bachelor, apostle Paul in first Corinthians seven, where he says the two are meant to be the husband and the wife belong to each other. They're meant to be interdependent. Just Mm -hmm. what Sean was saying. They're meant to be interdependent. Their bodies belong to each other. Don't, you know, you're, you're supposed to enjoy each other in sex and don't deprive one another, um, honor each other in sex, both of them mutually, which is, so that's sort of the overarching sort of view, biblical view of marriage and having sex, let it run away, be intoxicated, have it be um, a source of real passion, but it's safest. It's design is meant to be in this place. Yeah. I think as you, when you look at the the three <clears throat> major movements that end with that cautionary, you know, uh, don't arouse or awaken love until, you know, it's ready for, <laughs> I did not quote it well here. Um, <laughs> do not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. Uh, it's, it's to me, it's as you read what happens before that, cause she says, you know, your love is better than wine. Kiss me with the kisses of his mouth and all these types of things. Um, and you know, says things like, uh, talks about her perfume that he's like perfume that's lies between her breasts and all these kinds of things, you know, it's like, it's very exp- erotic and explicit. Um, and he's, he responds the same way, you know, describing her eyes like doves and all this beautiful poetry. Um, and their couch is green, you know, it's just all these things you're like, Oh, mm. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you hear the intensity of the love mm. and the passion they have for each other. And it's wonderful. And they're like really enjoying it. Like Kate said, and then I think when it it's like this weird kind of almost like she hits the brakes, but she doesn't. She's it's in the moment of consummation. They're yes. they're actually enjoying each other physically fully. And then she says, um, "I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem." You know, she's like, "I'm really, I'm I'm pleading with you." Yes, you know, when I say this, don't arouse or awaken love before it pleases. And she's saying like it is so big. I guess for lack of a better word, like Mm. love is real sexual love is so intense that it really needs to be in a place of safety because it can be overwhelming. That's what I hear is somebody who's just like, this was incredible. I'm overwhelmed with it. And it makes me just want to say like, it really needs to be in the context of a safe, committed relationship Yes, because otherwise it can overpower you. And I think that that's just, to me, that is what we see so often in our culture um, with the, you know, one night stand kind of thing, or we see it depicted in movies, we hear it in our songs, you know, we are about art as mm. Dandelion, and we we often hear us struggling with um, the gravity of our love, mm. you know, especially when it's been broken. Mm. I mean, if you want to hear something, go listen to Damien Rice. The guy mm. is like, Mm. So many of his songs are just laments about the pain that he feels. And he has just been like completely Mm. united with this person, whoever he's singing about. And, Mm. um, you know, and because you do, it really is what the Bible says. You become one flesh. Like there's a, there is a soul tie. Yeah. Connection that you can't easily undo. Yeah. 
And it's not to say that God can't heal those things. He certainly does. That's mm. what I want to talk about in a minute. But, but um, it is saying, it, it, I, I like it in this book because it's just acknowledging the gravity of this. It's not something to just play with. And when you do, I guess I'll say this last bit and then Kate's got something to say. When you do, uh, when you are frivolous with it on some level, you actually end up, and this is my, and I don't know this by experience per se, because I've only actually ever been with Kate, <laughs> but mm. when I listen and watch and kind of hear others um, that I've talked to and then just kind of watch, observe things in the culture, there's almost something that has to be shut off mm. because you're, you're throwing yourself out there in such a way that there has to be a, like a bit of a, a barrier, a numbing, mm. you know, it's just, it becomes just physical and all of that. Mm. And there's like this part of, there's a part of this, uh, the real need to be fully let in or to let somebody in, uh, there has to be a barrier built because it gets so intense. You can't allow it anymore. Does that make sense? Because you've been hurt so much in the mm, past. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Anyway. I, I know. I hear that. I hear that. Um, just to finish your thought, uh, it's almost like, you know, what I would want for, for our children. You know, I want this. I so enjoy the passion with you, but I want them to have it in a safe place, yeah. you know, and to really caution, you know, with their boyfriends and with dating that this is, it's not meant, uh, it's meant for a safe place where you can run wild and you're in this gorgeous garden that is walled and it's safe and it's secure and you can run wild and be naked and unashamed, you know, yeah. as Genesis 2 said before the fall. But this is a picture, this significantly happens in a garden, which we'll get into in a second, but you want, you want them to be able to enjoy the fullness of its joys, but in a safe place. So it's, I, you know, I really connect to that as like almost a parent to um, a child, you know, pleading to save it for the right place. Mm. Yeah. So tell us about the garden. So we want to hit on, we're going to end on the word of redemption because reading this will probably tickle some painful feelings for you. So we are so sensitive to that. That's a nice that. way of saying that. It's going to tickle some painful feelings. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know. <laughs> You'll be like, oh, this is so great. Why am I weeping? You know, it's like we're talking about wonderful passion. Everybody wants it, but it might really trigger some things. Well, because of, yeah. I mean, even if you're in a committed relationship with someone, a committed marriage, you may read this and be like, that doesn't, we've never had a night like that. Or, right. <laughs> yeah. Know? Or, mm -hmm. yeah. So you like the, the, there might be something lacking in your existing relationship mm. or you have never had this. You're single or you are divorced or you, uh, you, you know, you've just never experienced this. Mm -hmm. Or you had it and it's waned. It's waned. Yeah. Your, your marriage is like, you know, you're, however many years in and the passion from your youth is gone. Mm -hmm. you know, it's been, it's gotten cluttered with all the stuff you've got to do and coping with all the stress, you know, and yeah. the Netflix and chill. Maybe it's, maybe it's not working. Right. <laughs> and so that when you read this, it could just highlight what you wish you had or what you remember you had or what you always hoped you would have. And you mm. don't, you know, so like this is, it's just that intense. So go ahead. Sorry. I just wanted to it is. echo that. It is that intense. Or it might be filled with real regret, you know, or betrayal. Right. This is where you were betrayed. Yeah. You, you know? may have, you may have put yourself out there. Like that's what we were saying, right? Like, yeah. and that's, so you're building those walls right now. So like when you, when you're getting into another relationship, you're just, you're not sure you can ever trust anybody again. That's right. That's right. So what we love about having, God, go right after this place of passion and have it in the center of the Bible. And um, is because if this is triggering feelings of shame and mm. of regret or of pain on any level, that could be God can use, will use that for good. Mm. So listen to those things. Don't shut them down. Listen to it. Um, it's hit me, you know, it, it reignited me well into our marriage of like a desire that I wanted. And there were some 
ways I needed to take care of myself and make some changes in order to have this kind of passion again. Mm. And so this can hit you at any different life stage. Um, But God will use that for good because the place of our greatest shame is also the place where you will experience his grace the deepest. Mm -hmm. And so the redemption is that much more powerful. So he will always go after (laughs) the big things Mm -hmm. because he knows what he can do with them. He knows how deep his death went on the cross and that he has forgiven all things. Anything can be redeemed. And he is such a faithful lover to us that he will go after the thing that's really hurting and bothering us to bring his freedom and to bring his forgiveness and to bring his reassurance and to bring new life out of that place. That's right. And I think as we, as we read this book, we're going to, I think we'll always go between those two uh, realities, which we talked about two episodes ago, the natural, which is the the man and the woman indulging in their sex and their passion for each other. And then how that goes to the typology of God and his love for us. And that's the thing that we see even in this very first section. We see her longing for her uh, beloved and all of this. And then she goes into her self-description mm. where she says, you know, I'm uh, I'm dark. I'm very dark, but lovely. She knows she's a good, attractive person. <laughs> and you should too. You're of value. Oh, yeah. You are of value as a mm. person, as a human being. Mm. But she goes on to describe how... Um, she also has some areas of shame where she says, don't look at me because I'm dark. The sun has looked upon me. My mother's and son, my mother's sons were angry with me and they made me, um, the keeper of vine- of their vineyards, you know? So she's saying like, I had to go out and work in the fields, mm. you know, which was not a sign of obviously of, uh, wealth and all that kind of stuff. Mm. Cause you'd be very pale not mm-hmm. being out in the sun, but she was weathered and uh, describing herself as kind of worn out. Mm. And so we can read ourselves in there with our pain. If mm. this is bringing up areas of in your life where you have suffered in love mm. or for lack thereof, mm-hmm. that we can describe ourselves as dark and as, you know, as our vineyards have been unkept. That's right. And that's and, what she says. And it's, you can read in between the lines here. It mentions her, her mom later and her um, brothers here. So it's possible that her dad is dead. And he's not there. And she's now in the hands of her brothers and her mom. And um, and her brothers are, you know, taking advantage of her. Yes. At le- very S- least sending making, her out. making her work. Yeah, yeah that's right. what I mean. Not, right. not, not sexually. sexually. Not necess- right. It's not implying that, although, you know, that can happen. But I don't think that's what this text no, is I saying. No, I think it's just saying she was forced to work. It's like Cinderella. I mean, she's basically kind of describing it's yeah. like a Cinderella description. Yeah. She's been abused on some level relationally um, and being taken advantage of. And so we can see ourselves there. And she is longing to be loved mm-hmm. and to uh, be met in that place. And we hear then the response. Mm. And this, I want you to hear this as the Lord for you. I mean, if you're not experiencing this on a human level, that's okay. It's, it's painful, but it is okay because our ultimate love is Mm. from the Lord. And the glory of this book is that it is showing us the intensity and the passion and the heightened experience of what it is to know love horizontally on this Mm. planet between Mm. each other. And it is just a shadow of eternal love, of Mm. the love that God has for us. Mm -hmm. That if it's this intense between two humans, like just hold on to your butts, everybody, because it's so much Mm. better with Jesus. Mm. And so this is his response to her Behold, you are beautiful. You are um, you are the most beautiful among women. You know, I compare you, my love, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariots. Your cheeks are lovely with ornaments. Your neck is a string of jewels. I mean, he's just fawning over her. Your eyes are like doves, and he's just singing her praises. Behold, you are beautiful. You know, and that's just how the Lord looks at you, as a lily among brambles. So is my love among the young women. <laughs> and that may be hard for you if you're a man listening to it, but it's okay uh, because we're all the bride of Christ. But I, I want you to, we want you to think that as we move, we will start with the natural, but we'll always move into this place of how we hear the promise of God's love for us in this book That's right. and his promise for you that in that place, like Kate said, that place of shame, that place of deepest pain, 
that is actually where he is putting his finger right now. He's putting his finger on that because he is all about healing. And he wants you to know his love and passion for you there. It is stronger than Mm -hmm. what we read in this book. Mm, Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And as you're describing that particular passage right there, uh, Song of Songs 1, um, verses 7 through uh, 15, she um, wants to be with him and is like, where can I find you? I don't want to have to go looking for you because if I have to go ask around the other shepherds, they're going to look at me as one who veils herself, like as if a prostitute. Mm. I'll, I'll come across as like a prostitute while I'm wandering around trying to find you. Mm. So could you just tell me where where you are? <laughs> <laughs> so I don't just tell me where you are. So I don't appear, you know, um, uh, people don't look down on me, basically. Yeah. And that reminds me so much of the sinful woman um, in Luke 7 mm. who has heard about Jesus and of his forgiveness. And she is known as a sinner, um, as somebody who has not been keeping her vineyard. She would definitely be one of the women who reads Song of Songs and has, you know, a pang of regret or a sense of betrayal or a sense of hurt, which Song of Songs was written at that time, you know, so she would not be having a pleasant experience reading the Song of Songs. Mm. And so if you relate to that, which we all can, because we are all broken lovers, Mm. as we argue every week, um, in some way, even in a great healthy marriage. It still has areas that need forgiveness, that need um, the Lord's attention. So anyway, she was dragging herself into this dinner party and she walks by and certainly is scorned by the host and by the dinner guests. Mm -hmm. And it actually records in Luke 7 that the host looks at her and she begins to weep at Jesus's feet and wash his feet with her perfume and her tears and her hair and kiss his feet and, you know, just show all of these signs of gratitude, all of the kinds of things that you see in Song of Solomon, actually, all of the five senses, the fragrance, the kissing, the, the wet tears, you know, they're all here, but in gratitude of his forgiveness. And the dinner guests look at her and they do look at her like, you know, who is this woman? Just right. the way in Song of Songs, the Shulamite woman is like, oh, I don't want that to happen to me because that stinks. Who likes that? Nobody likes being looked down on by other people. Mm. And so this woman in Luke 7 is receiving that kind of scorn, but she is knows that Jesus will accept her. And, and he certainly does. Right. He looks at her like the beloved looks at his bride in the book. Mm-hmm. And he loves her deeply. And it results in this effusive love Mm. from her to Mm -hmm. him Mm -hmm. that he then celebrates. And he says, what she's doing for me is beautiful and it will be remembered. So yeah, this is, it's a beautiful picture of how the promise of God is here in this book. Mm -hmm. And she, and he says, you know, she loved much because she's been forgiven much. Right. And so, and, and he loves her very much, you know? And so he, she, he reinstates her in the public eye and defends her to the, the host and mm-hmm. to the dinner guests. And so now she has Jesus advocating for her, Jesus forgiving her sins, which are many, Jesus loving her first, which gives her the grace to be able to love him too, you right. know? And you know, it's this natural re- reciprocation. Just like you see in this between the bride and the groom and natural reciprocation, you see that between Jesus and this woman that he loved her first and that made her love him back. That's right. It is love begets love. And mm-hmm. that is how it works. God loves us first. And so we love him in return. That's that's exactly right. And that is what we see in Song of Song, Song of Solomon. We've called it two things, Song of Songs, Song of Solomon. It's referred to as both, <clears throat> depending on your Bible. But mm. um Thank you for listening. I hope that that was encouraging to you today. Uh, We're going to continue to walk through this book, this very erotic, interesting book of Mm. poetry in the Bible. And we're going to continue to see how uh, God celebrates love, how he is love and he has created it and he's Mm. given it to us to enjoy. And it is all, all the love we 
experience on this earth is a shadow of how great his love is for us. So uh, thank you guys for listening. I think I started this episode, did I? I don't even remember, but here we are. Um, <laughs> Take us home, Sean. Yeah, you can find in the show notes uh, the ability to look at our website, dandelionministries.org. And you can also find the ability to support the show. <laughs> Kate's mocking my sentence structures here. And uh, we just are grateful for you listening. If you are listening to us on Apple Podcasts um, or any platform where you can give us a review, please do so. And we hope it's a good one. <laughs> and, uh, and also you can send us your questions or your prayer needs and or your prayer needs. Uh, my email's in the show notes as well. So we look forward to hearing from you. Hope you, hope you guys have a great week. Yes. Thanks for listening. Okay.